All right. We're, we're going to get going again in just a moment. You're at, you're at Baby Castles? Puedo practicar mi bebe castellano? Sí. We're really glad that Rafael Perez y Perez um, is able to join us, as I mentioned. He has been um, a computer science-based researcher working with artificial intelligence systems and modeling the creative process, looking at how computers can be used to model the process of creative writing. And uh, as the subtitle of his book suggests, this has been going on for 20 years. Um, his system, uh, Mexica, is one of the leading examples of a story generator. And the book is just one aspect of this, one way in which it uh, manifests itself. But he has a large number of research publications. He's done many types of research projects that involve integration with other systems, that involve some of the things that um, uh, aren't immediately evident in the book, but that involve uh, uh, social status and hierarchy, that involve illustration. So, uh, so this is this is only one aspect of a very long-term research project, um, and yet still a very impressive one. So, here um, to present Mashika, let's welcome Rafael Perez Perez. I have to say also, he's a professor at Yuan Kualimata uh, down in Mexico City. I, I have to give his title as well, so I'm sorry about, uh, about that. I was so enthusiastic about his work, but I forgot that. Here is Professor Teres y Perez. <laughs> Story 18. Some years ago, the princess was born under the protection of the great god Huitzilopochtli. The lady was proud to be a member of the Mexica society. While she was walking, the princess had a terrible accident and was severely injured. The, la the lady treated the princess's injuries. The princess remuner remunerated the lady for all of her help. Unexpectedly, the lady saw that the princess had the sacred knife that was stolen from the temple. So there was no doubt she was the murderer of the old priest. The princess produced in the lady conflicting feelings. After consulting a shaman, the lady decided to exile the princess. The lady produced in the princess conflicting feelings. The princess decided to go to the great Tenochtitlan city. Enraged, the princess provoked and offended the lady. Quickly, the princess and the lady were immersed in a fight. With all of her strength, lady, the lady hurt the princess. The princess made a potion and drank it quickly. She started to recover. Endlessly, the princess reproached herself for her incongruous behavior. The princess decided to go to the Quetzalcoatl temple. The end. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm really, really happy to be here at Baby Castles. Thank you so much, Nick and Baby Castles, for, for this opportunity. Um, as uh, Nick mentioned, I work for the Autonomous Metropolitan University in Mexico City. Um, this book, Mexica, is called 20 Years, 20 Stories, because in December 1997, I defended my PhD dissertation. And this book was published in December 2017, a few weeks ago, so exactly 20 years after um, I defended my PhD dissertation. So for me that was the first uh, version of the Mexica program, and I wanted to celebrate it with this book, so I'm really happy about that. Also, I should explain what Mexica means, because maybe not everybody knows. Um, Mexicas are the old inhabitants of what today is Mexico City. <coughs> Uh, the Spanish call them Aztecs, but that's not the correct name yeah. uh, because the gods told them to call themselves Mexicas. Uh, that's the reason Mexico is called Mexico, because of the Mexicas. Mm -hmm. So um, this book uh, is settled in that environment. It is not, um, uh, it doesn't reproduce any valid historical uh, uh, stories. It's, um, I just wanted to 
produce something related to, uh, with my country doing uh, computer science. So that was the, my way to do it, calling in Mexica and setting all the, all the uh, stories in, in the environment. So you will hear, as you have already done, characters like the Jaguar Knight and the Eagle Knight who were, were very high rank uh, uh, warriors. Uh, and cities like Tenochtitlan City or Popocatépetl Volcano, and so on. Um, let me read another story, and then I will uh, explain to you briefly what was the goal behind the development of, of Mexica. Story six. The Eagle Knight, the Warrior, and the Jaguar Knight were good friends. The lady, sorry, that day, the Warrior found the Jaguar Knight irresistible. He was in love. The Jaguar Knight and the warrior flirted with each other openly. The Jaguar Knight was impressed by the warrior and he fell in love with him. While they were walking, an old tree fell on the warrior and the Eagle Knight. The Jaguar Knight decided that he had to help the Eagle Knight. The Jaguar, knew, the Jaguar Knight knew that the warrior could die and that he had to do something about it. The Jaguar Knight went to find some medical plants and cure both the warrior and the Eagle Knight. They were grateful. The Eagle Knight adored the Jaguar Knight. He just could not help it and he fell in love with him. When the warrior realized that the Eagle Knight had feelings for the Jaguar Knight, he freaked out. <laughs> the warrior insulted the Eagle Knight because he was irritated with him. The Jaguar Knight felt passion and odium towards the, uh, the warrior. Instantly, the warrior and the Eagle Knight started to punch each other. The warrior producing the Eagle Knight conflicted feelings. <laughs> the Eagle Knight produced the warrior conflicted feelings. <laughs> With a mercy, the warrior took the Eagle Knight life. The Jaguar Knight struck the warrior furiously. The Jaguar Knight producing the warrior conflicted feelings. The warrior wounded the Jaguar Knight head with a rock. The Jaguar Knight made a potion and drank it quickly. He started to recover. In that moment, the warrior was not able to, under to understand the Jaguar Knight conduct. The Jaguar Knight was confused and was not sure if, he, if what he had done was right. Hurriedly, the warrior ran off to the Popocatépetl volcano. The end. <laughs> So um, Mexica is, uh, is trying to contribute to the understanding of the creative process. So it's based on this idea that the creative process has two states, engagement and reflection, and they interact all the time. So during the engagement, we are just generating and generating ideas. The typical example is, is daydreaming. When we are daydreaming, the ideas just came and came and came. Suddenly we stop and we switch to reflection. During reflection, we evaluate what we have created or generated so far. And that evaluation is very important because it produces, produces a set of guidelines that will constrain the production of material when we uh, return to engagement. So that is the, a continuous cycle that repeats and repeats until the story is finished. And that's what I represent in computer terms in my program in Shika. That's the, uh, the main idea. So it's very useful for those who are interested in this model because you can observe you know, what is going on inside. You can have the chance to see the mind of, of Mexica and play with several parameters that are there and, and well, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to, to read uh, one last short story and I would like to read first in English and then I would like to read in Spanish uh, in order to give you a taste of how it sounds in, in Spanish. Although it's important to mention that um, the next version of the book should include Nahuatl. Nahuatl was the original language of the Mexicas. Yeah. So hopefully next time. <laughs> so far, I also I have to say that um, Originally, uh, Mexica wrote everything in English uh, because it was my PhD dissertation in the UK, so I had to read in English. Uh, my professor didn't understand Spanish. So, but Nick suggested for this version to, to produce a system that could 
generate these stories in both languages. And I thought it was a wonderful idea. And you will find all the stories in English and in Spanish in this book. Yeah. Well, in fact, everything, the preface, the uh, for after work, mm -hmm. and all that. Well, so uh, here is story 17. The princess woke up while the songs of the verse covered the sky. The younger I was proud to be a member of the Mexica society. Some years ago, the Eagle Knight was born under the protection of the great god Huitzilopochtli. The princess and the Eagle Knight wanted to inflict vengeance on the Jaguar Knight, so they unjustly accused him of betrayal. Fiercely, the Jaguar Knight hurt the princess. The Eagle Knight went to find some medical plants and cure the princess. She was lucky. The Jaguar Knight was aware that the princess hated him. He had to escape. The Jaguar Knight decided to go to the Popocatépetl Volcano. Cuento 17. Para la princesa saberse un mexica era un gran honor y una gran responsabilidad. Aquella mañana, mientras la gran ciudad de Tenochtitlán volvía a la vida, el caballero Celote contemplaba su grandeza. Aquel día el caballero Águila se sentía lleno de energía. La princesa y el caballero Águila acusaron falsamente al caballero Celote ante los sacerdotes. Enojado, el caballero Celote hirió a la princesa. El caballero Águila le administró a la princesa la poción que había preparado. Ella mejoró rápidamente. La princesa tenía un gran resentimiento hacia el caballero Celote. Por ello, en ese momento el caballero Celote determinó huir. El caballero Celote decidió partir rumbo al Popocatépetl. Thank you so much. The True List to David Ferry. One. Now they saw the foothills and the air king, the earthworm, the slip hound exceeding the king, the heart woman, the ship hound, the hard path river leading the ship, the trap light welcoming the work, the man water, the high hound, the past water, the fish tail, the turn cloth, the soft hand alighting, and the sick eye, the overless house, the void word, the port woman, the blur woman opposing the lock, the fly cloth pondering, the tail fish, the sick storm listening, the foot sack welcoming the wood, and the ear tail alighting, the earth yard supporting the list, the land side tail, the dead work, the cross yard dreaming, the blur light pondering, the ship wing facing the stone, the land hound, the deadless turn, and the snowbed, the night town, the forelock, and the footbed following the horse, and the airboat, the port house hurtling, the hand house, the port ring, the plum worm dancing, the river worm, the moon head facing the king, the wood book, the waterback night, the bird's backness, the heartback air exceeding the house, and the mansack, the woman town exceeding the house, the downhound listening, and the flyhead facing the field, the book bird supporting the light, the lock woman, the void boat opposing the stone, the rest king, the water hand. The true list is the title of this book-length poem. Uh, and the sense of true that I use in that word is not uh, that of truth and falsity, but rather of truing a bicycle wheel or setting a picture or a table true to a wall or a ceiling. It follows a principle. And so I don't mean to say that uh, in any way uh, this is true as opposed to false, but rather that it does follow a principle, and that principle is explained um, fairly concisely in the last page of the book, where a one-page program 
that generates the entire text of the book and does so deterministically um, is contained. This program is also available online, so if you want to um, see the text of the book and read it uh, in that context, you can simply get the program and read it yourself. You can modify it, you can study it if you like. I also have a complete uh, studio recording of the book that I did at the Wexler Studio at the Kelly Writers House at the University of Pennsylvania. That's online for free listening and also for free download. The True List is also um, the title uh, because it's a solid compound in English. You can take two words and put them together without a space between them. Um, that can be done in several languages, certainly in German and Russian. Um, not as easily or um, in the same way in French or in Spanish. Um, although, of course, you can juxtapose concepts uh, in any language. And when you do juxtapose concepts like this, um, you create metaphors. They're sometimes called kinnings in the English poetic tradition. They're also called conceptual blends in cognitive science, where you take two words like foot and hills and put them together, and that's a very conventional metaphor. That word is in the dictionary. We know what foothills are. But it's also a metaphor as if the landscape were a body. And when we approach the foothills, we approach the foot of that body. The air king, on the other hand, in the second line, is not a conventional metaphor. We have to imagine, if we're going to read this, what the air king might be. Is it the last airbender? Is it a fantasy type of uh, creature? Is it a contemporary monarch, a male monarch, who doesn't have any power, is just a celebrity, is, a, is king only of air, or of airtime, perhaps? Um, you may come up with a different interpretation or meaning of that, but if you want to uh, read this line by line and use your imagination on this text, some of these conceptual blends, some of these words, some of these compounds that are generated, um, you would probably come up with the same interpretation as others, and some of them might be particular to cultural and individual experience and background. And so I hope I've created a text that's open in that way to uh, someone traversing this landscape of language. I also want to mention, since uh, so many of the people I thanked the, and institutions that I thanked in the acknowledgments are represented in the room, that uh, I want to thank uh, uh, them here in person. Uh, they are Flourish Clink, Allison Parrish, <laughs> Stephanie Strickland, Baby Castles, and the School for Poetic Computation because they've all been very important to this work, and I, I've, only the people who actually looked at this and helped me with the manuscript are those who were mentioned. <clears throat> and the flat eye following the list, the blue wood reflecting the eye, the trap town supporting the storm, the void bird, the true book hurtling, the man side sick exceeding the ring, and the air yard reflecting the man, the firelight, the cloud back land dreaming, the highway earth, the past land, the head town opposing the woman, the lock head pondering, the home field, the hornwood, the crossfish mourning, the moonfish and the landway, the bone away star, the crosshead, the lightfish pondering, the bone storm, the cornbound river, the blood hand, the hand hound, the bookstorm, the sand word, the land like love, and the bearway reflecting the board, the corn wing, the air hills morning, the forebound sick, the birdhouse, the life side sand, the earth word, the blue light, the head ring, the side woman, the bloodline opposing the wood, the bare stone, the waterwork, the horse sack, the overbook, the blurweed listening, and the woodway, the hard like love, the bookfish reflecting the king, the hard word, the snow king, the boards plainness, the sick board leading the horse, the river board, the earth book welcoming the room, the wood water, the door cloth hurtling, 
the earth fish, the lock yard, the sky house shadowing the land, the life work, the hard storm, the true field and the air hand, the hand sack leading the storm, the hand like ring, the earth stone and the lock eye, the dead cloth, the free hills and the ear line, the works knighthood supporting the cloth, the waters flyness, the long line, the salt cloth alighting, the ship away snow, the cloud sack, the head fire, and the man yard dancing, the sand house following the light, the true word, the ear house opposing the king, the soft weed leading the man, the stonefish supporting the light, and the dead bed supporting the king, the cornfish, the workaway blur pondering, the overlist mourning, the blur sack, the sky horse, the lights bloodhood, the riverback earth delighting, the long book pondering, the blur field alighting, the stone tail, the fire line, the corn line exceeding the hills, the ship back horn, the river hound, and the hard man pondering, the long boat delighting, the book woman, the true path sand, the dead stone delighting, the cross room, the head back ship, the water like blur, the rest bound air, the void field listening, the light weed, the hard hills welcoming the ring, the side wood dreaming, and the whip way pondering, the man's bloodness sleeping, the woman light, the stone weed, the light eye, the night water, the high path night, the slip bird, the blood tail, the ship king, the hornback fly, the work tail, the cloud tail following the light, the horse work, the blur worm, the horn like river, the door hills facing the land, and then the foot weed. Thank you. So it's a little bit like, it seems a little bit like, uh, you know, and stop making sense after the song when David Byrne says, any questions? But I do want to invite uh, questions for Allison, for Raphael, for me. Um, if, if people do uh, uh, have things that they'd like to ask of us, we can also talk with you more informally, of course. But, um, yes? Uh, I had a question for Allison. Um, <laughs> so when you're when you're doing this, did you try any other similarities um, measures and or just like different parameters with the ones that you did that didn't work so well or worked in different ways? Yeah. So the um, the phonetic similarity took a long time to get right. The first draft of it was just based on like phonetic. Um, um, no, I'm, I'm like standing, <laughs> um, standing and, and speaking, uh, speaking um, through amplified sound is like one of life's wonderful pleasures. <laughs> it's extremely addictive. Um, the first version of the phonetic similarity was based on um, just the phonemes themselves of the words. Um, what I found was that that didn't get the granularity that I wanted. It wouldn't move smoothly through. The phonetic space, so I had to break down the phonemes into their constituent features, like phonemes that have like that use the lips, phonemes that use the teeth, phonemes that use the the velum, the back of your the back of your mouth, and so forth. Um, so that was that was the getting that tweaked just right to do that was was difficult. Um, I've also been experimenting a lot with semantic similarity, and that's that's super easy to do. There's like uh, um, a technology, a natural language processing technology called word vectors, like word to vec, um, that just assign a vector to every word based on its context, which more or less captures its meaning. 
and that's that's also like fun and interesting and I've been doing that a bunch but that didn't make it into the book because it was not as satisfying I thought um, as the other forms that I was working with. So. Other questions? Yeah. Actually, I have another question about Alan. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, another question. No, I'll, I will, I'll sit and um, just be tall. <laughs> well, I'm sitting. You said at the beginning that you select like three million lines that sounded like poetry. Mm -hmm. Was there a process involved in that? Was that manual? Um, yeah, so the it was that was with a, a computer program. Um, it was all of all of Project Gutenberg, and then basically I just took the volumes that had been tagged, like the genre had been tagged poetry, and then in that just used like a heuristic to say like if it's indented over and the length of the line is not fully across, then it's probably a line of poetry. And you could, you could I mean, that's all we can say about poetry is that the lines are indented. I guess. <laughs> Uh, and you can you can hear in there that there is like a bunch of stuff that got in that isn't actually from poetry. It's like in the commentary that accompanies the poetry and stuff like that. Um, I would probably want to clean that up a little bit better. One thing about this book project is that I've gotten a lot more familiar with that corpus, and I have like a good feeling for it now. So I, I should probably give it a second try and isolating those lines of poetry. But it was good enough for this. I had a question for uh, everybody, but um, I was just curious, how much of your time slash effort is spent on uh, the generation of the content versus the editing of it, if you could speak to that, if that makes sense. I don't know if, sure, sure. or does everybody, is everybody also kind of aiming at writing code that generates really interesting, like hard hitting content from the start, or do you find yourself spending a lot of your own like human intelligence uh, on that task? I was just really curious about uh, that aspect of it. Sure. I mean, I can start. So, yeah. I mean, I don't do any editing of the of the text itself. But the work that I create is that program on the final page, and um, uh, I certainly um, spend a lot of time, um, including, for instance, you know, one of the things is the, the ordering of those compound words that are the basis of each line. Uh, something that took more than a year to um, uh, to uh, settle upon. It's represented by you know three integers basically on on that on that page of code, um, but uh, um, you know yeah my I mean some people do use uh, um, computer generation generation as you know like Jim Carpenter called it a prosthetic imagination so like here's some you can make a draft and then you could edit it Charles O Hartman someone who did some things like related to that where but um, no I just uh, uh, I want to. Uh, build everything into the system, that um, uh, and let the and let the system be the work um, that uh, is is uh, you know as complete and polished as possible. I don't edit anything from the system. For me, it's very important to have an autonomous <coughs> agent. I'm trying to represent some of the aspects of the creative <coughs> process, so I don't touch anything. Um, I'm also surprised by, by what the system generates. That's important thing. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will not make sense no, in this project. You even included some stories that are self-evaluated as not as not being very good, right? Yes. I, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I, I, was, yeah. By the system. I mean, I didn't mention this before, but the system includes a, a, a model that evaluates its own outputs. So uh, it's part of, if you want to study what creativity is, you, know, you need to include the evaluation. That's, we take it for granted, but it's a really complex process, and it includes a lot of things that we're just starting to discover. So the system has a way to evaluate its own outputs. And in the book, uh, you will find stories that uh, got the highest possible evaluation, but you got also stories that have very low evaluation because my idea was to show you not know, the different kind of things that the system generates. It's an author, so uh, and the system can include it in its own knowledge base those stories that it considers as uh, good. So it has a procedure <coughs> to do that. Um, I, I'm also, I think, uh, just the same, the same as the other two in, in wanting the program to produce, the program itself to be the thing that has the aesthetic 
and the aesthetic <laughs> judgments inside of it. Um, having said that, the research that went into this book is also part of the research that I'm doing in making poetic text composition interfaces. And more than just, <coughs> just like a prosthetic imagination, I feel like computers have the ability of like giving us new metaphors for controlling how, how text is produced. And that's part of this idea of similarity is that, you know, similarity that you control, um, I think would be really interesting. Like this text composition process, you can kind of control with a knob that like controls how fast you're moving through that similarity space and stuff, and stuff like that. So making interfaces for writing poetry, I think is, is interesting. And that's part of what this research is about. Um, so I want to make tools for other people to do this kind of stuff. and make their own aesthetic judgments in that framework. Cool. Thank you. So what, um, both you, what, um, you only input single syllable words. And how many did you input? Yeah, so the system really, there's no input to it the way that, uh, that um, it's presented. There's a single page of code that has the data Embedded in it, of course. I, you know, so some of that is some of that is 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 words. I, I chose only standalone English words, most of them monosyllabic, yes. that can participate in these solid compounds. And how many were there? Um, well, there's a different number that can be in the first position and in the second position. How many total vocabulary? I'm going to have to refer you to the last page of code, which I generously provided in the book and online. Uh, for exactly these sorts of questions, so. Did your input include phrases as well as words? I don't work with natural language processing. I mean, that with the language we use, not everyday uh, language. What the system generates are plots, sequence of actions. They are interesting, coherent, and novel. That's what the system does. So <clears throat> I developed some tools to provide the equivalent of experience to this writer, yes? In order to write, you need experience, you need knowledge about the world. But I want to know about the vocabulary. Is this a recurrent vocabulary that occurred in every story? I, um, what I provide is what is called a dictionary of story actions, which include the actions, which include emotional consequences, because for me, more than the vocabulary, the important things is the emotions, the emotional relation between characters and the conflicts, that's the main thing I use. And also I include, I also include, let me just finish this, I also include in this dictionary some text that the user can uh, use, uh, incorporate to the action in order to generate the final output. So you're calling Templates. the emotion, you're yeah. the, em the emotion, at, you locate that at the syntactic level, as opposed to the vocabulary No, level? it's abstract. It's, uh, <coughs> yeah. It's a computer representation of emotional relations yeah, in between characters. It's generated from the bottom up. I want to know what the size of the vocabulary is. That's at that's a the last step. So okay. after the plot is generated. The <laughs> well, it's like what I was saying, that uh, that vocabulary, the thing you heard now, is the a text that the user of the system can add to each of the story actions. So for example, the, you can define the action, character A attacks character B. Yeah. yeah. So the system can just, as an output, put attacked, or you can include a text as a user who says, uh, the character A uh, uh, furiously attack character B. Okay. So every user of the system inputs their own vocabulary. They can if they want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So remember, I'm representing how the creative process works. So it's, the idea is that you can have a flexible tool that no, can be I'm experimented. I'm interested in the output, which is what we heard. Mm -hmm. And the output drew again and again on the same phrases. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I wanted you to know how long it took to get that output. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how many words did you input? Well, how many words did you input? One thing is, so for each action, there's like four templates. Yeah. That four. Can be, okay. Yeah. And so some actions are frequent and then that when they come up very often in stories, you'll get repetition. Yeah. So. No, I don't mean that. Is that how many different words? Okay. And did, were they input at the phrase level or at the word level? 
It's a phrase like that you, you include with this template. With, uh, I've been on tour with them, so I'd say like a hundred different words. <laughs> 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 yeah, what would you say for Nick? I mean, I mean I've read Nick's through. Not three million, times. that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a question. Oh yeah, uh, just a follow up on that same point, I guess, with generating both the English and the Spanish versions, did you find that you had the same amount of variations for a given phrase or action in both languages, or were you having different numbers for each of those, depending on how you wanted to express them in those languages? Uh, for both Spanish and English, I use four templates for each action. Okay. Yes. But um, you can play with that. I mean, you can use one or you can put of course. 50. Just asking for you, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, one more for Raphael. Do you agree with Mashika's opinion of its stories? <laughs> well, it's not a question of uh, agreeing. I like that Mashika is able to produce these stories. And actually, the topics uh, are very different. Some topics, are, uh, you can find match stories there, you can fa find uh, l love stories with betrayals and things like that. So it's not a. Uh, that if I agree or not with the particular topics that he develops, uh, what I love is that he can develop all these different, uh, very much related things to humans. Yeah, I think the question was, when the system thinks one of the stories is not so good, mm -hmm. do you agree that that one is not so good? Yes, sometimes uh, I can agree with some, in the same way that sometimes I don't agree that it's that good. No, so no, you, I, you I, for me, with your sometimes, yes. Um, that's the, the important thing is that it has its own opinion base. No, 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 it it produces an, an explanation. Did you agree with your system? Um, as experienced programmers, do you find that the languages you write in affect your aesthetics? I don't even know what your program is written in. What? Like programming language. Or did you mean human language? I meant programming language. <laughs> Do you find that the language that you write in, the programming language, affects the um, aesthetic choices that you make? I, I mean, for me, it's obvious that it does, because I also write in 6502 assembly language for the Commodore 64. And the things that I write are completely unlike, I mean, most many people wouldn't recognize them as, you know, audiovisual objects in the world, but they certainly are unlike you know, this book of poetry, basically, that's developed using, uh, using Python. And I think um, part of that is, for me, I'm, I'm actually writing very concise programs intentionally, and I'm trying to be in conversation with the people who developed the 6502 processor, the people who, uh, Guido Van Rossum, and the people who developed the Python programming language, Larry Wall, and the people who developed Perl, when I work in Perl. So I'm, I'm actually, um, that's, that's part of my, of my consideration. Now, not everyone thinks that way. If you, I mean, the, the ideal of being a, like a big game developer would be that you can just deploy across every possible platform and everything is you know, totally generic and so forth. But that's, that's not how I feel. Um, and so for me, the, the answer to the question is easy. I, I, I think that I do very different things when I'm programming in different languages. I just like to program in one language, which is Delphi. Uh, I, because I, that's what I learned when I was in the university. I, of course, I have programming in <laughs> assembly language, in, in different C, whatever. But, but, uh, so, <laughs> um, I think I kind of have a similar answer to that. Actually, like I, I use Python for pretty much everything, and that's like it's the tool that I know, and the tools are really the the tools in Python as a programming language make it very easy to do this kind of work. Um, and so for me, like Python is just like it's the it's the transparent window um, versus using a language like I I teach. JavaScript, and so I find myself like having to use JavaScript for other tasks, and I think that in the work that I make in JavaScript, you can sense the, the pain. And the pain. <laughs> it's, like, it's just I, I don't like using JavaScript for that task, and for language-related tasks, it's just not easy, and so it does it does definitely affect affect the work in weird ways. But it's also like 
this particular thing that I made, it would have not made sense to make it in another programming language. So. Just, just let me say that I, to my students, I always ask them to use any language they feel comfortable with when I ask them to make a program. I don't require any specific language, just program whatever you feel comfortable. Yeah, um, this question for Allison. Uh, like, so, Project Gutenberg is a really valuable resource primarily for just, just like ease of access and yeah. uh, legal use. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you had a like ideal, uh, perhaps, data set or, or set of texts to apply this kind of phonetic similarity or syntactic similarity, if there's anything like right. if I could give you a USB <laughs> stick with a like set of a text file that would you could legally use, like what would be the ideal <laughs> collection to apply this to? Are you are you offering? <laughs> <laughs> are you like the genie granting me a wish here? Yeah. Is it like, yeah, is it like a maximalist thing as much language as possible, or like a curious thing? I'm curious, like where your inclinations are. Um. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I think the the thing that I get for free with Project Gutenberg is that poetic diction, mm -hmm. and the language is like immediately recognizable as poetry. And that sort of like helps situate the work as as poetry in a way that it definitely wouldn't if it was like you know Wikipedia articles about rocks or something like that. Um, although that would also be amazing. Um, I I don't know. It's it's really weird. It's sort of like asking like um, what what sculpture material would you use, right? Like. Um, if you could use any sculpture material, what would you use? And that, that just really comes down to like the skills that you have and the, yeah. the tradition that you want to be a part of. Um, I don't really like working with Project Gutenberg that much, just because the texts that are in it are, are very much like biased toward particular groups of people. <laughs> like People who got books published before 1924 tend to be in English tend to be like a very particular group of people and it's not representative of a larger group. The flip side of that is like I'm okay with stealing from those people. Right? Like, I, I am totally okay with just like laying waste to some um, the wasteland for example um, or Wordsworth or, or whatever. Um, I think I mean I would love to work with a corpus of more contemporary poetry. I think that could be interesting. But that's also like in those cases, like if there's there's somebody in the room with me whose poetry that I'm using, like I don't want to use that poetry unless I know that they're okay with what I'm doing with it and with the particular way that I'm using it. So the benefit of of dealing with dead people is that you don't have to ask for their permissions. Um, so does that kind of get it? So, I mean, one of the things, like, somewhat related to the programming language question is that lexical resources, like the things that you might use in corpora, like Project Gutenberg, so the CMU pronouncing dictionary, for instance, and Project Gutenberg, right, if you look across human languages, natural languages, then the stuff that you would need is very different. So, for instance, in Japanese or Italian or Spanish, you don't need a pronouncing dictionary because there's very regular rules for pronouncing the language, right? Um, on, on the other hand, the can you find three million lines of poetry in the public domain using the same resources? Probably not, because English has had a, a long digital head start in, in volunteers putting that work online. So, and then when you get into things like WordNet, which is a, a, you know, a very elaborate, uh, um, uh, thesaurus-like um, uh, ontology project, those resources exist in some other languages, but sometimes they're non-free, uh, and sometimes they're very very much smaller, and uh, and they're not available for artists in the same way. So I, I, guess, I guess my wish would be that like we had <laughs> more communities of people that were empowered to make these mm -hmm. kinds of corpora for the kinds of writing that they do and the languages that they speak and stuff like that, just that there was a wider variety so that people could make these kinds of things in languages and communities that they that they belong to. That's my wish. Todd, make it come true. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um. Thank you. <laughs>
thanks to everybody for coming out. There are books in the back. There are beverages in the back. Um, there, there are conversations to be had. I'm, I don't know how rapidly we're going to be chased out of this basement, but um, you, we can hang for a little bit. Uh, uh, it's great. It's great to see you all here.